Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess and I'm here today with Erin Wathan. I'm going to try and pronounce it, but I could be wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she'll tell us in a minute. Um, but Erin has written a really interesting book, which I think the majority of people could do with reading, simply because it addresses a really, really major issue that a lot of clients I see and I'm sure that she does as well have to stand up and face and the book is called why I can't stick to my diet and and I see it a lot in people that no yeah I get this thing all the time I know what to do I just need somebody to be accountable to or I need somebody to to tell me why I'm not doing it or whatever else it is and unfortunately um Erin's written a great piece of work which uh, kind of tells us all that but um very brief intro, and I'm sure she's going to tell us all about herself in a second. Um, food addiction counsellor, clearly an author because of the book, um, and a certified life coach and holistic health practitioner. So um, a lot of different areas that she brings together to get people um, to face up to things and, and get it fixed. So Erin, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, surname, did I get that right? No, but good try. Oh. Um, it's it's Waffen. Waffen, okay. Right. Maybe it's my accent. It's not great. Um, so, listen, while we're here, tell us about your background and, and how we you've come to this point because everyone has a great story. And what's yours? I was just one of those girls who was a little overweight when I was growing up but became a lot more overweight once I hit about puberty. You know, a lot of just sitting around watching too much TV with – zero portion control um didn't really understand the combination of you know food lack of exercise it all slowly packed on until the summer between my ninth and tenth grade year i lost 30 pounds in one summer wow Um, i know and i lost so much weight that a couple high school teachers thought i transferred in from another high school even though my high school was so small you wouldn't have like not noticed that that was my first real diet. And ever since then, it seemed as though it was on a diet about to go on a diet, gaining weight. Cause I was very much not on a diet and just this up and down, up and down roller coaster of gaining weight, losing weight, never just living. And I, you know, was an athlete. I taught through fitness for 12 years. I ran races, you know, very fit, yet I had this major sugar problem where I was always like having bags of candy everywhere, drank Diet Coke by the gallon, and my weight was always fluctuating. I could never guarantee what I was going to weigh in six months. It was just always very like much an unknown. And the thing is the entire time I was exercising religiously and I just never put the connection between like the fact that my diet was out of control with the fact that my body was not how I thought it should be. Um, I had a couple kids decided to teach exercise as a career because before then I had like a corporate job and I'm like, okay, well I'll just, you know, make some extra money and get really into this fitness thing. And then I'll be like the fit mommy. And then my weight still wasn't where I wanted it to be. And I remember saying very psychotic things to my husband, like, why aren't I skinny? And he was like, uh, I got to go to work. You know, <laughs> what's he supposed to say, right? Um, and it wasn't until I realized how if I didn't have like my caffeine or my sugar or whatever it was every day, I was just nasty. Like, and it wasn't just like the usual, like I need coffee to survive kind of like jokey stuff. Like my head would hurt. Like it was not good. Or that when I had a really hard day with my kids, I would end up like, you know, eating a bunch of frosting or like any emotion I had, like I'd be bickering with a relative. I would be opening up the fridge, eating ice cream while arguing with them. So like, it became very clear to me over time that like any feeling I had somehow was somehow was ending up with food. And also all the exercise in the world 
was not able to keep up with what I was ingesting. So it just it was a slow sort of realization that I had to get this whole like food thing under wraps because I even worked for Weight Watchers. I was a lifetime member for that. Like I, all these things were like I would lose weight for a while and then it would slowly come back. And then I would blame the diet. I would blame myself. I blame my husband. I'm kidding. I would blame all these other outside forces, not really understanding that it wasn't any of that. It wasn't up to any of those people to like help me figure it out. They could assist me, but they couldn't do the work for me. So when I really got into nutrition and realized, okay, I'm addicted to sugar, first off. (laughs) Second of all, like I'm definitely emotionally eating. And once I was able to wrap my brain around those two statements that I was addicted to sugar and I was an emotional eater and realized there's not a big problem with those two facts and a lot of times people get very uncomfortable with those or they think there's a stigma and there really doesn't need to be because there's so so much sugar everywhere it's almost impossible unless you are super super educated and in the health industry to not be addicted to sugar in a lot of countries and also we're conditioned to be emotional eaters it's your birthday have a special food it's a holiday special food it's friday special food like there's special foods every day of the week somewhere so to celebrate in our culture we eat so hence emotional eating so once i got over my um just basically like my hangups about those two facts and got really the nutrition, everything came together. And so the 10 pounds I'd been wrestling with forever fell off and they took another, you know, eight pounds of their friends. And I realized I needed to definitely like get the word out. And I got a bunch of certifications and I decided to write my book because I knew that it was a very good way to get to women and after 50 shades of gray i knew that moms you know 20 somethings 30 somethings would read things on e-readers they might not necessarily want to read in the, like paperback at the airport <laughs> a little more discretion but a title like why can't i stick to my diet is kind of the question we were asking ourselves or i've been asking myself myself off and on since I was 15 it's and a, it wasn't it's, very, it's a very common question from a lot of people because it is a very common question. yeah yeah because you know as I said earlier a lot of people you know in their head they know what to do now they may not actually know what to do but they at least have an idea about what's a healthy diet and for some reason they find it almost impossible to stick to something for an extended period of time. Um, And I, you know, I've got a few theories as to why that is. And, you know, in a day, the, the, the diet in inverted commas or the nutrition plan that's going to work for you is one that you can stick to and that, and that makes you happy. Um, But it's a very, very common question. And I, in fact, I had somebody on the uh, phone to me the other day who may or may, may not listen to this, but she'll know who she is. (laughs) <laughs> and, and she basically said, look, we keep having the same conversation every year. You know, she'll ring out the blue every so often and go, oh, you know, I need to talk to you about this again, blah, blah, blah. And, I, yeah, same thing every time. But why can't I change? Why can't I do it? Because you're making it too complicated you know, in her particular case. But um, there are so many different reasons why people emotionally eat, right? And they don't emotionally eat chicken salad. No, broccoli is not a problem. Yeah. You know, so what, from your perspective, is it that drives people to this sugar craving or the, this sugar addiction um, as opposed to going, right, well, I've emotionally got all these issues going on, so I want to I better my life by going and eating a, a decent meal. Why does that not occur? Well, some of it is, by, is um, just evolution, right? So, you know, if you think of, like, we're not that far away from like our cave survival days in which you know honey was very scarce you know 
fruit was very scarce, you know, especially given your environment. So when we did have access to something sweet, our body went very excited. We ate as we could very quickly because we might not run a, you know, the harvest might not come for another 12 months. There's that kind of biology happening when we get, um, we run into something sugary. We do not live in caves. There are ding-dongs or ho-hos or cookies 24-7 all across the land. So, but our biology still has that, like, wow, this is exciting. You know, the pleasure sensors kick in, the hormones, the dopamine, our blood sugar rises. But through all the genetic modifications of the sugar and the flour, it rises and it falls even quicker. And then we have to decide, are we going to keep it up or not? So oftentimes if you eat something really, really sweet, you'll have that like rush of, you know, pleasure just for, to simplify it. And then 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, you feel kind of yucky again. Well, do you have something sweet again? Or do you just go back to feeling even worse than you started? So that's part of it. But also a lot of it is just conditioning. Like our brain has this like pattern of like a feeling we don't like food, a feeling we don't like food. And unless we're willing to make a new connection of a feeling we don't like coping mechanism, a feeling we don't like coping mechanism, which could be meditating, journaling, running, you know, calling a friend, just sitting with the feeling. Like if you sit with the feeling you don't like, anger, frustration, you know, sadness, you will not explode. Mm. I've never had a client explode from a feeling they don't like. It might feel like it the first couple of times. But when we eat, and it's, like I said, it's never broccoli or you put chicken salad, the sugar, the fat, the whole thing, and also what we oftentimes go to is something that can be eaten very quickly. Ice cream goes down very quickly versus say, you know, something that doesn't like something a very labor intensive, you know, like ribs, like those are very sticky and hard and you got, you know, lobster takes a lot of work, right? The food everyone like binges on is, is just very easy to go down quicker. It's, it, it hits our bloodstream quicker. It's easier to chew. Um, so when we want that immediate gratification, it's only immediate. And, wow. and you know what? Long- I, you, you're absolutely right. Sorry. The, 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 no one wants a food that they, ne- that they have to spend 20 minutes, half an hour preparing. And then 20 minutes, half an hour eating. Like, oh, like I mean, we got dinner last night. My daughter ordered a lobster. That thing's a pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a pain. It's a total pain. But, you know, the dessert cart came around. I mean, she ate that piece of cheesecake in record time. Yeah. So... You know, I'm sure calorically the damage was way, I mean, think about it, way worse than the cheesecake. But the instant gratification is in in an instant. As quickly as it comes in, it goes out. So when we emotionally eat, it it instantly gratifies us. So it comes in, it goes out. It's also like the wear patterns in our brain are already established. Biology is against us. And then the shame kicks in. What did we do? And then... The chemical reaction of all of those foods we cannot escape from. So the fat, you know, their body starts processing all the fat, you know, the huge caloric load starts making us feel bloated. And then we have a lot of emotions about it usually. We would not have a lot of emotions about the chicken salad or the broccoli. Mm. I mean, it's not a huge shame cycle associated with you know, a salad from three days ago. But if you speak to someone that binged three days ago, they could probably tell you what they ate if you could get them to tell you at all. So what I'm going to do with my clients or my readers is to try to be neutral about food, to not live for it, to not be afraid of it, to just, it's part of life. It's not, it doesn't need to be life. It's just part of life. When we are, you know, faced with this emotional connection to poor poor food choices so be it yeah. the sugar or you know the donuts wherever else it is um 
Where do you think that gets instilled? Childhood, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it comes, you know, well-meaning but misguided adults and family members. You know, first birthday cakes, you know, summers, ice cream, that kind of thing. And also, it kind of works in a sense when we're younger. Like, you have a bad day, someone hands you something sweet, it feels better. And then we're celebrating you, it's your birthday, let's put a candle on it. So I think it comes culturally. And then through time, it gets reinforced, like any bad habit, right? So then you throw in like the food industry, you throw in society, and then it's very confusing because on one hand, we worship fit and skinny and body image. On the other hand, we have all these advertisers and marketers and cookbooks and cooking channels. So it's a very confusing place to be at if you don't have your head on straight as to what you need to be doing. So that's where I believe a lot of that comes from. And I also know that oftentimes the words like deprivation or I don't want to you know, feel sad in the holidays or a lot of certain words come up a lot when you talk about taking away someone's food. Mm. When it doesn't need to be that way at all because you know what? A hundred years ago, no one ate this way. So we're not taking anything away. In fact, someone shoved this in our face. <laughs> like it's a, this, was a, this is actually a violation of us as human beings that people like you and I are trying to like sort out for everyone. Yeah. We're not taking anything away from you. Like you need to live. In fact, these things are shortening our lives. Like I forget who said it. It was like some like celebrity doctor to the stars kind of person. I think it was Mark Hyman where he said we went from being – a culture that went from avoiding communicable diseases to one that manages chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. and, and most of that is lifestyle induced. I thought that was so profound because you watch a movie from like a hundred years ago, or whatever, it's all about like polio and you know, all these diseases everybody you know brought over with them or whatever. And then now it's like managing being diabetic, heart disease, smoking, all these things that we do to ourselves. And how did that happen? We did it to, we, we do it every day slowly. So it's not deprivation to like, let's eliminate the junk that we don't need. Absolutely. Do you know what? Um, there's a, there's a guy in Australia called Marty Kendall who has a, um, a really good website called optimizing nutrition. And, oh. um, I know him pretty well and he's been on a couple of times. In fact, he's, we're recording another show soon, but, oh. he, but he went on holiday um recently to uh, uh an island and he's and he's spoken about this before and i'll, I'll i will get into to talk about it when i do the next recording with him but so he went to an island uh where the indigenous people were always ate really well he used to say i love going there because the food's amazing it's all grown on the island and you know it's it's brilliant and it tastes so good because it is organic and this that, and the other and it's just a throwback to the way people should have been eating years and years ago and everything else he said but the issue is they go and sell their food at market and so that when he goes there he goes to the market and he buys the food and he loves it and all the rest of it they then take the money and go to the supermarket and buy oreos oh no and he said so the south of the island and, and i could be inaccurate here but anyway part of the island where they have the commercial area for the tourists these people are getting obese and they're putting weight on and the rest of it because they're going and buying sugar and flour taking it back to their homes and making all this western food and in the north of the island where they're not so tourist he said you can go up there and see them and they're a completely different person you know they're, they're all fit and well and they eat that you know the right stuff and everything else and he said and that is just a uh great example as to how this sugar fat flour you know the crap that people are eating is destroying lives he said but the real problem was it was cheaper to eat that than it was to grow their own food it's frightening and and that was the problem and so it, you know you can understand it if 
culturally, like you say, you're given sweets to maybe make you quiet because you're making a noise, right? So you're given sugar. You've got the holidays and the and the birthdays and everything else. That's where it get, you get it as well. And children know what they want pretty quickly, and they will stamp their feet and not eat broccoli until you get eventually give in and give them something that they want. And if you're not very careful, if you condition them like that, that will definitely go into adulthood. And we see it now. I, I heard Rob Wolf say the other week that the youngest case of type 2 diabetes diagnosed in the US now was 26 months old. Oh, my God. And it's just how have you even got that much sugar into a, a, a child that small? But there, it, it, it is. You, like you said, it's an, it's an uneducated parent who has lived like that anyway for four or five generations and it's always been the case and so what's the difference how you know it, how, it's not even bad for you kind of thing in their head and it's cheap and it's the only thing we can afford to to feed you you know those things are what's destroying western society in my opinion right now yeah no absolutely i mean the thing is it's so scary about that island analogy, I don't even know where this island is specifically, but you hear it time and time again. And China is a great example because you know China was cut off from the rest of the world for how many years? And then whenever they opened everything up, here comes America with their KFC and their Taco Bell. <laughs> mm. You know, fast forward twenty years and they have all the health problems we do. Yeah. Because we come with our Apple phones and our Diet Cokes and our tacos. And here comes, you know, type 2 diabetes. So it just goes hand in hand. And because that food is manufactured and designed in labs to be as addictive and as unhealthy, yet hit all of your taste buds, your pleasure sensors in your brain. I mean, Oreos were designed in a lab by food scientists, I think in the late 50s, early 60s, to check off all of your boxes in your brain to be as pleasurable as possible. Like and fat sugar ratio is ideal. Yeah. The, the size of it is ideal. The way it fits in your hand. I mean, it's, I mean, I studied it when I was in my food addiction training program as to, I mean, it's gross when you think about it, but it's also fascinating in the same way as how many things now are in like Oreos are in like, they make, like ice cream and Nutella and mm. you know they're in weird stuff too like um like whipped cream and stuff <laughs> like Oreos are just managing me and everything but because Oreos are like this um, example of modern science meets the food supply and you know then they make double stuff and they make the thin ones they make the mini ones and they make cereal Okay, that's never good. Then they make chocolate dipped ones. Then they make minty ones. And they make Halloween ones. I mean, then what's interesting too, if you go into another country, depending on what that country's like individual like tastes are, like you know, some countries go more sweet, savory, what have you. The Oreos will be different, yet the fat sugar will be the same. So how Oreos adapt, yet they still keep <laughs> keep the various countries in their grasp it's it's really it's really something um, and also yeah this is just my personal opinion i don't think they're that nice so honestly i mean they're all right but you do if you start eating them end up eating a ton of them but the, but the actual the actual thing of eating them i don't find it that that attractive but i can see why people keep eating it it's but like the whole thing the texture the taste the you know the, the sugar rush off of it and all that kind of thing and then they you'll go in the supermarket and they'll be half price oh yeah no i mean i mean the, the, the packaging is designed so you know with the the um the sticky tops and they're and they're all in like the the row with the plastic like everything about them is so you zone out and eat as many as possible mm. okay like so we you know, a lobster, it's a pain to eat a lobster. It's really easy to eat Oreos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and so we know that there's an issue culturally 
and sadly in islands that don't have it they're, they're going to have the problem um, yeah. if we recognize that as the main issue how is it that we can then reframe that association with sugar and break that cycle First of all, we need to acknowledge the elephant is in the room and that moderation does not work because one of the greatest urban legends to me is moderation. And what I hear lots of times from my clients is I want to be normal. I'm be like everybody else. I don't want to deprive myself. And then when I point out to them that, you know, is being normal, you know, being on eight types of medication by the time you're 60 or is being normal this, that or the other. It'll always give me a strange look, but so much of our food supply, like I'm talking traditional grocery stores, you know, where you just don't even think about it. You don't read any labels has hidden sugar in it. And there's, I think the last time I checked, there were like 50 different names for sugar mm. because the manufacturers are so good at hiding it. And the best way I know to tell, to illustrate this is I was at something for my daughter a couple of weeks ago and I ran in there late and I was hungry and I just, um, got like a roast beef sandwich and I scrapped the meat off of it because the bread looked disgusting. And I thought I grabbed mustard and within like one bite, I could tell there was sugar in it because I'm just so sensitive to it. So when there's sugar in mustard, that's what keeps people addicted to yeah. it. There's, I know there's also like sugar in hot dog buns, there's sugar in chewing gum, there's sugar in so much stuff that unless you really go out of your way, it's really hard to get away from it. Like I had a client the other day and she's been really, you know, on point with everything. And then she was saying that she doesn't know what happened. Um, she had a couple of her kids potato chips like on a Tuesday and then by like Saturday, she was like eating a gallon of ice cream. And I said, well, it's because chips had sugar in it. She's like, well, why would barbecue chips have sugar? I said, barbecue sauce is like two thirds sugar. She had no idea. That's fine. I mean, my, everyone needs to know the things that level you and I do. But, you know, anything in a package has some sort of sugar in it, most likely. So knowing that right off the bat, you just have to be very, very aware of what you're eating because it keeps the sugar in your system and the more sugar we want the more sorry, the more sugar we eat the more sugar we want it's just how the biology of it works and it's so incredibly addictive and yet it's completely normalized like i could send my nine-year-old into any store in america and he could buy it no problem I mean, oh yeah it's, it's available it's not, well even the even the advertising on TV, I don't know what it's like in the states now, but certainly over here, there's been a huge uproar about not advertising junk food before nine pm. Because oh, interesting! It, yeah, you guys are lucky then. We don't have that at all. <laughs> because it used to be, um, you know, every children's program, there the advertising in between would be junk food, candy, yeah. sweets, you know, whatever else it is, just to hit that market early because you know if you're if you get a customer at three years old that's a customer for life totally and it's totally. worth an awful lot of money to a company and if you're getting hundreds of thousands of them every day you know that's a very long-term business so um so there's some changes afoot they've they've um taxed or if, if it ever haven't happened already they're definitely going to they're taxing um sugary drinks over here so you have to pay more for them um the, the manufacturers have reduced sugar in a lot of the uh, fizzy drinks, um, which is great because by reducing it, it means the tax is less, therefore the retail price is less, therefore people keep buying it. So, you know, those things are fine and they're, and they're moving in the right direction. But when somebody has had a bad day at work or someone has, at home has annoyed them or they've fallen out with someone or whatever else it is, you know, that sugar addiction definitely kicks straight in and that's what they reach for. From your perspective and your clients, how do you get them to be mindful about that? It takes time, but it also takes wanting to have a better way of living because 
any habit we have, it just the first couple times you don't give into it, you have to acknowledge it is there, right? So you have a bad day at work, and that usually meant you had you know ice cream in your house. Well, don't have ice cream in your house is the first thing I would tell you. Second thing is when you're having a good day or a good moment, we would write down you know five coping mechanisms or things that would make you happy for when you have one of those days because this is the thing life's not going to get any easier or better or different just because you've decided to clean up your diet it just isn't and the food even if the legislature decides that they're going to cut back on you know advertising or whatever the odds of them outlawing oreos are very slim (laughs) <laughs> so mm-hmm. let's just, I mean, we just have to be realistic. So if life's not going to get any easier and food's not going to completely go back to how it was a hundred years ago in the world, what can we manage ourselves really? So it's how we're going to look at our problems, how we're going to intentionally handle those feelings. What's our mindset going to be? And let's think ahead of time. Let's visualize, all right, so we're having a bad day at work and we're going to come home. We're going to call a friend. We're going to go for a run. We're going to go to yoga class instead. You're going to buy a pair of shoes online. I don't care what it is. But, you know, set a timer for 20, 30 minutes and maybe you just sit there and you journal. You do something. But I really discourage everyone from eating when you're upset, even if it's something healthy, because you don't even digest it well. And it just makes the association of like feelings and food, you know, bad feelings and food just keep on going. So the first couple times that I have a client who used to emotionally eat a lot, when they're able to sort of like understand that food is not going to help their crazy sister be less crazy about who's hosting Christmas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They can see it's possible because eating ice cream is never going to make your sister less demanding ever. But the fascinating thing about it is all the times when we ate ice cream, when our sister was crazy about hosting Christmas, for example, at the time it seemed like a good thing to do. And then our sister's still crazy and then our stomach hurts and we have all this sugar in our system and then it promptly crashes. And then we have a problem we're used to handling, meaning the calories, the stomach aches, the bloating, the drama of eating too much last night. Then do we go to the gym and undo it? Then we realize that's destructive behavior, blah, 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 blah. While the fact that our sister and I got whether or not the issue of the tip with our sister isn't really addressed and that's the issue that needs to be addressed. So often with the current, you know, big picture or big business approach to weight loss is all of the surface level stuff like keto or paleo or whatever's in style this week, detoxes is let's talk about macros and macros are very important you and I could probably totally nutrition geek out on macros all day right but what's behind it and the behind it is usually unmet emotional needs misusing food eating or not hungry and then the food that they're eating like we said it's never broccoli it's junk so there's a lot of moving parts but at the root of all of it is our mindset, our feelings, how we look at the world. So the first thing is to acknowledge that the system we're using isn't working, right? And, yeah. And know that what you do to yourself is not going to change the behaviour of others. So if your, yeah. hus- if your husband or your wife has annoyed you, you know, and driven you crazy that day, having a tub of ice cream isn't going to change them. Um it is going to make you feel worse. So it's probably not a great method of coping. Um, Before we start recording, I did say something to you in a a brief chat. And I think when people get stressed, some people almost 
do things they know are bad for them. So they'll smoke cigarettes or they'll eat junk food or whatever else it is or drink alcohol because they subconsciously think that oh, I'm not going to let the the neighbour, the, the boss, the husband, whatever it is, control how how I feel in a, in a bad way. I'm going to be the person that can do the most amount of damage to me. So I'm going to do something that I know is not good. And they kind of have this thing about taking control back from the other person and go, look, watch me, I can really, I can really hurt myself. And then there are people that go to even more extremes than that by physically actually hurting themselves. Um, but we won't, we won't go down that road. But the, the, the point that you made about acknowledge that what you do to yourself is not going to change the other person, that's hugely powerful. Because once that's in someone's mind, and then they go, well, you know what, I'm not going to have the, the food, maybe I will do the run, or maybe I will go to the yoga class, or meditate, or you know whatever else, or I'm just go and have a bath. Sit there, listen to some music, chill out, and just forget about it all. And then when I get up, I'm going to have my, my dinner, which is going to be a decent meal, or I'm going to have my lunch, whatever else it is. If you can interrupt that pattern, then you're, you've got to be at least 50% of the way of going the right way, right? Absolutely. And so often, you know, you and I can sit here logically and say, you know, why would ice cream that I eat tonight help my boss be less of a jerk tomorrow? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but when we're in the middle of it, you know, we're reaching for the tub of ice cream, right? So having those decisions, those thoughts, those intentions before the crisis, before the fork in the road is where a lot of the work can be done ahead of time. You know, looking at those past patterns of why did, you know, why did I use that to cope? Why did I think that would work in the past? It never worked. It never worked. It might have distracted me for a couple of minutes. It might have, you know, felt something. I was rebelling. I was empowering myself. I was, you know, fill in the blank for a short period of time or the immediate, like I said, the immediate gratification is only immediate. But as far as a real solution, you're never going to find a solution to a personal problem in the refrigerator in the refrigerator mm. it's just not how life is but so often you know i'll see like my husband come home from work and just like go to the fridge i'm like are you just like checking the temperature of the house mm. <laughs> like, what are you doing like do you think fairies came home and put something cool in there like i don't know but a lot of us just have these like really really interesting habits when it comes to food and like how things are but if ahead of time you know, we were able to kind of look at ourselves, not in a judgy way, almost like a science, like observing way of, you know, hey, when I did that that one time, it didn't make any, any sense at all. And when my kids were really little, now they're nine and 13, and I live outside New York, and we get all four seasons, which, side note, very overrated. <laughs> and I, I remember one time, uh, they, uh, there was a snow day. Which snow days, if you're a mom, can come out of nowhere and your entire day can be just completely like just giant wrench thrown in it. And, you know, it snowed a little bit and, and then they were completely my problem for the rest of the day. And I had, I don't even know what I had scheduled. But I remember I took them to like a kid's museum, which was hectic and sticky and nobody got along and there was fighting in the car. And then... We got home and I put them in front of a movie because they were still like preschoolers or little. And then I remember I sat down in, I put them in their, like their, their room, like their TV room. And I sat in the room they aren't allowed to go in. And I just sat down with like a tub of like buttercream frosting with a spoon. Made complete sense at the time. Mm. (laughs) Because I like was stressed out and they were annoying and it snowed and some stupid person decided to make it a snow day when there was not even enough snow, if I could go to the museum, I mean, I just had it all rationalized. And when I hit the bottom of the tub of frosting and about 20 minutes later, when my stomach started to hurt and all the chemicals and all that other stuff started to kick in and I realized that was a really bad idea and my kids were still here, (laughs) they were still home. 
um, it's just one of those memories I go back to of at the time it made complete sense to me because I was still in that pattern of I have something I don't like that's going on in my head. How can I change it as quickly as possible? And food was what I went to at the time. Mm. But now, like, I mean, my kids are still super annoying. I'm not going to tell you that they're not annoying. I just don't think food's going to fix it. Yeah, and, I know. And, and you know what? When, when people are in that place and they're just eating a, a tub of ice cream, whatever else it is, I don't think you even recognize that you're eating something. You, you no. certainly don't enjoy it because your head is having the argument with your boss or with whoever or in your head you're oh. shouting at the kids whilst you're eating and you you, don't, you, you finish it and go, what, what even was that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the best example I have of like the group zone out is the movies because everyone just goes and buys this popcorn that tastes like straw <laughs> and candy or giant soda and or sometimes all three and then we all stare at this giant screen if you've ever gotten up during a movie and gone to the bathroom and seen everyone just eating and their mouths are kind of open like a bunch of cows and they're just like putting in food and they're not chewing it. They aren't looking at like all the intuitive eating things. No one's intuitive eating and everyone stops when they are done. Like there's nothing left to consume. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing to observe now that I'm on the other side of it. You know, when we really pay attention to how often people talk about food, like, you know, especially around the holidays or on vacation, like when's, when's dinner, what's for dinner, where are we going for dinner, wasn't dinner great, what are we doing tomorrow for dinner, there's so much conversation about eating, and it's, it's really like the tent pole of our lives in a lot of ways. Let's get together for coffee or dinner, or, you know, it's always a ground eating. The the talking of the holidays, Christmas in your in, okay. in the States, Thanksgiving, uh -huh. uh, the vacations, all the rest of it. You know, these are things that people almost give up on because they know oh. it's coming, right? So, oh. and what, what's also quite interesting is people will will diet for a holiday. Oh, I'm going on holiday in six weeks. We're going on holiday in two months. I need to diet to go on holiday so that I look good on the beach. And then they'll hit a all inclusive and and <laughs> eat whatever is in front of them because now they can do that and they come back feeling like crap. And after eating their, their body weight in rubbish food for seven days or whatever else it is. So with that in mind and knowing that, you know, people go, well, holidays are coming up so Clearly, there's no point in me starting a diet now in November because it'll just get ruined in, in Christmas. As far as I understand in this country, and you know, I'm guessing it's the same over there, Christmas Day is one day. And and yet it is is looked upon as though it's almost December. You know, Christmas is coming in, therefore, all we're gonna do is eat for at least a week. And that's gonna ruin everything. And but don't worry, because New Year is coming. And that's when we'll make our resolution and we're going to lose all that weight. We're going to join the gym and we're going to buy all the, all the fat-free or the calorie-free food because that's what's going to do it for us. And, and here's another thing, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before. Why is it that you go and buy a load of calorie-free food and it costs you a fortune? There's nothing in it. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly, right? So let's say I'm coming to you now going, oh, you know, it's Christmas coming. What am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to put on at least another 20 pounds because we're going to eat all the, and I'm sure, I mean, we don't have it here, but in the States, they love the um, sweet potato with marshmallows in it or something like that. They, they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah whatever that is. Yeah. Some craziness. How am, I, <laughs> how, how am I going to avoid that? Well, the thing is, this is what's really amazing, and I wrote an article. I forget where it was published. So in America, we have this holiday. It's called Labor Day. It's the first Monday of September. And I know our, our um, seasons are totally opposite, but fall starts for us the middle of September. So when it's still in the summer, Starbucks puts out their fall drink, which is called a pumpkin spice latte. So this year, they, in August, started 
pushing out their pumpkin spice lattes. It's still hot out. And the thing about seasonal food is people go out and buy it because it's special. Even though it's hot out, people were buying some pumpkin spice lattes. So fall started in August because Starbucks said so. <laughs> I know. And pumpkin spice lattes are just toxic sludge, which I could talk about forever. Anyway, so when we have the holidays or the holidays mindset, let's just use that. We have this idea of everything being special. But if I'm looking at my calendar right now, that means the holidays for me started in the middle of August and will end the first week of January. That's about half of my year <laughs> right there. Right. So in America, most people, cause we have Thanksgiving, which is the second or third, no third thanks third Thursday of November. But a lot of people start hitting the Halloween candy really hard October 1st. So we have pumpkin spice lattes in August. We have Halloween candy in October. And then all the Christmas stuff comes out November 1st. It's like Christmas explosion outside right now. And this is what I tell people. And I've done the math. So between November 1st and January 3rd, there's something like, I think it's 184 meals. Four of those are holiday meals. Christmas, Christmas Eve, Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, or New Year's Day, whichever one you want. So 2% of those meals are true holiday meals. The rest is a, is a choice. So it's all how you want to look at it. Now, if those four meals are just the most amazing thing in your family and it's you love every single dish, which I find very hard to believe, that's one thing. But most people, it's all the little things in between. It's the Christmas parties. It's the cookie swaps. It's the junk in the break room at work. It's the neighbors that drop off the giant tin of whatever the heck that stuff is that you say thank you and you don't throw out as soon as they leave. Mm -hmm. It's the mindset of it's the holidays. I'm just going to put on my fat pants and worry about it later. Yeah. But the problem is, is when January 3rd comes around, we feel so horrible because we've ha eaten nothing but just disgusting food for weeks on end. The last thing we should be doing is going on a juice cleanse. <laughs> but everybody does it or whatever some celebrity says to do that year. And most New Year's resolutions, I think the date is February 8th. Most people fail by then because they never figured out why they gained the weight in the first place. Mm -hmm. They just went on some sort of fast. But the thing of the holidays, too, is it's a couple meals. And when I look back at the best times of my life, and I'm sure you can do this, too, what did you eat? You probably can't even remember, you know, whether it be like the birth of your child or wedding or whatever it was. It was never what you were eating. It was who you were with and what you were doing and the circumstances and all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. So if we make everything about food over the holidays. We're missing an opportunity to actually be with people because we're so obsessed with the food. And don't get me wrong. Like, we have a turkey, we have all the other stuff, but I just don't make everything about food. And with the holidays as well, you cannot tell me every single dish that your mother makes is wonderful. I do not believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. And every single dish your mother makes, even if she's the world's best cook, you don't love equally. Because there's usually like one or two things that you really do maybe truly appreciate that is special to you have a little bit of it but then make sure there's also healthy things meaning like green vegetables and there's you know some sort of healthy salad or even whatever but in america our thanksgiving is a very much a set menu 
and everything on that set menu is brown. It's really gross. It's like the sweet potato thing you were talking about. It's pumpkin pie. It's baked potatoes that have been scooped out and made into mashed potatoes. It's gravy. It's stuffing. I mean, it's like the tan food group. And then everyone drinks a lot and watches football. Well, if you decided to throw in a bunch of asparagus, it isn't like the Thanksgiving cops are going to come in and like arrest anybody. So you can make tweaks to it. And you can also do things like, I don't know, not overeat. Or the next day, get back to normal. Or the day of exercise. Like There are so many things we can do around these holiday meals to not have it be an entire weekend because Thanksgiving is four or five days depending on how many days your workplace gives you off so you're not you know binging out for five days straight so maybe Thanksgiving the the meal of Thanksgiving you might eat a little heavy but the other you know 15 meals that weekend you don't have to those are choice for making and the trouble is we get stuck with the people around us so society that's going right it's christmas so come on we're going to have a few more drinks or come on it's mm-hmm. christmas we'll have another we'll have a, a special lunch today i know it's only wednesday the 14th of yeah. december but come on because christmas is coming we'll do this and that and you're right it, it starts early and then finishes late and then people wonder why the third or fourth week of january and you know if if february the 8th is when they break the resolutions Generally, it's because they feel really sick. You've got this flu season. And mm-hmm. and basically, they're sick because for the past two months, they've really abused their body, and now it's just broken. Yeah, they've lowered their immune system with all that inflammatory exactly. food. So, oh, I can't keep this, up this diet because I'm feeling so bad. I've got a cold or I've got flu or whatever it is. Um, can't work out. I can't do yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? I just, need, I just need to have a carb refeed, whatever that is. And it's just like, really? Like, I mean, you're just missing the point. Do not get me wrong. This is tough stuff to actually carry out. But the logic of it is very simple. And in the moment, it's having that awareness to say, right, this is me reacting to the sweets that are in front of me and picking up a handful and eating them. And that's three, 400 calories that I'm eating for no reason. And I'm going to do that three times today. And all of a sudden, you wonder why you put on 10 pounds. And having that awareness, being able to break that habit, with coping mechanisms, that's I think probably the major thing that people need to get get on top of. Um, with, with there's also um, a real issue with sleep. Yes. I know it's a complete tangent, but it kind of all does fit into it, and people don't realise it. And we've done many podcasts on sleep and monitoring it and how to get better sleep and, and this that and the other. There is nothing that does not get better with good sleep and i'll give you a brief example so today is monday i think and um, anyway friday just gone i went out to dinner with um louise villa senor and his fiance and a few others from keto gains for uh for dinner in london he was visiting and kindly said do you want to come along and it was a brazilian barbecue which means you you go to this place and they bring skewers of meat around until you say stop. Yeah, I've been to that before. <laughs> and, you know, if you're following a carnivore diet, then it's great because you get to fill up on everything that you ever want to eat. But anyway, so I don't eat late at night normally. My latest I eat is probably 8 o'clock. And then I try and go to bed at 10, half 10. And so I've had a fair amount of chance to at least start digesting some of my food. Anyway. This is an exception. I go out, we eat late, I eat an awful lot of meat. That sleep that night, because I track it with a with an aura ring, my resting heart rate did not go below 68 and was an average of 72 the whole night, which is phenomenally high compared to my normal 50 or 51. Oh, wow. And and that is just such a visual example as to how your behaviour and your your food choices and everything else. Don't get me wrong, there was no sugar in it. We weren't eating cakes or sweets or anything like that. And we weren't, you know, it, it was literally just meat, vegetables, 
and that was it. But the volume of it and the late night and everything else and then getting the train home and, you know, all that yeah. kind of thing and then just the whole thing just absolutely ruined that night's sleep. But that was only once. You know, for me personally, it, I don't drink alcohol and, and yeah. I haven't got anything against it. I, it's just not something I do. Um, coming up to, to holiday season, that one night that I did, that, you know, majority of people in society will replicate that for many nights and they'll go out and they'll be drinking, they'll be eating late, getting home late, getting to work, get, the next day will be the same thing. There's another party, there's another, oh, we've been invited to this thing by this other company that supplies us and they want to take us out and this, that and the other. And, you know, one night ruined my sleep. To do that for a month is just going to break someone. So, sorry, it's me going off on a rant. But, so yeah, so sleep. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, the thing is about sleep that's, that I always... Um, tell my clients is that their list of priorities is their food, their sleep, stress management, and then exercise, which they always are like dumbfounded with. Because if you have quality sleep, you're going to make better food choices. You're going to feel less stress, the stress response and the cortisol and everything. And we know so much more about sleep than we did you know, even 10 years ago, right? Because remember all the like, I only need four hours of sleep and all this other stuff. Yeah, I only well, need now, four hours if I want to get Alzheimer's. Yeah, I only need four hours for a nap, right? Um, so, but when we don't get enough sleep, even, you know, less, which is considered less than six, like hormonally, like everything gets hay goes haywire, like, you know, um, we we have a harder time regulating our appetite. We're more likely to be drawn towards carbohydrates for energy. You know, we typically um, have just less energy, which is obvious, but we're more likely to try to go to caffeine for it, which energy does not work that way. We can't like replicate the energy that is, you know, our, our body actually needs that time to regenerate. You cannot you know, just drink more caffeine. And there's nothing that can duplicate or replicate the restorative benefits of sleep hmm. with, you know, five hour and little energy things you can buy at the drugstore or whatever, no matter Red Bull in the world. Um, but when it comes to our appetite and weight loss and all these other things, I remember back in the day, I used to think it was more important for me to work out than sleep. And now I think the exact opposite. And I advocate the exact opposite because we will always make better choices, feel better, be a better version of ourselves if we're more well, if we're better rested. But to circle back to your partying analogy or just one bad night of sleep, when we do that day after day after day, our hormones are just going to be more and more whacked because we're not going to have a good sense of our appetite. We're not going to have a very good sense of, you know, when we're actually hungry anymore. We're going to have a hard time feeling full. And the sleep we are going to get is not going to be very good sleep because we're going to feel a lot more stressed out. Our cortisol is going to be higher. So our heart rate's going to be higher. And then we're going to be going to bed with a full stomach. And it's really hard to get a good night's sleep, almost impossible, quite frankly, on alcohol. So when someone gets invited to a lot of parties, this is what I say to them. Eat ahead of time. Eat something normal ahead of time. Odds are no one cares if you eat the food at a party. So if the party is from, you know, 7 to 10, eat dinner at 6, no one's looking at you, really. Mm. Be full Especially, when you go. At least if you're yeah. full when you go, you're not going to make those poor choices because generally, you know, at most gatherings like that, the food isn't that great anyway, right? Well, as much as all the food's gross. Or, I mean, and unless it happens to be a dinner party, which you can talk to in a second. Yeah. But if it's like a password or a party or a grazing station party or whatever, eat, you know, eat something normal, you know, go to a place, you know, that has like real food, 
bring it from home, eat it at six o'clock like you always do, you know, brush your teeth, ladies, I would say put on lipstick, whatever, and just know that you're done for the day. And when you go to this cocktail party with the clients or you're the client or whatever, plan on, you know, maybe a drink or maybe having, you know, club soda with lime and no one can tell the difference. But if you decide you're going to keep on drinking for an entire month, you're going to feel horrible. It's just how our bodies work. You can't exercise it away. You can't burn it, get rid of the toxins or whatever, whatever. It's just impossible. But when we have this idea that we can just make up for sleep on the weekends, that's also outdated. You just, it's a, it's a cumulative effect. It's a compound effect. We need to just get in that mindset of trying to go into bed at around the same time every day getting up around the same time every day and also eating a pretty regular diet, not having a lot of extreme food on the weekends or what I see a lot of people doing is they starve themselves during the week and they, what I consider binge all weekend. Hmm. They just, that, you know, boomerang back and forth, you know, they will be five pounds higher on Monday than they are on Friday. And it happens every week. Like, why aren't I losing any weight? I'm like, <laughs> because you aren't eating consistently. So as far as, you know, the holidays, you know, eat as all the days that aren't true holidays, eat as consistently as you can, you know, get you know, the nights that you don't have any plans, go to bed early, eat normally. And then if you happen to be at a dinner party, you don't have to eat everything there. You know, look for normal proteins, ask for things on the side, lay off the alcohol. You can always decline dessert because sugar is never like a good thing for you. But just be aware that like the holidays are a mindset. The holidays are a choice. And you never regret the next morning that you didn't have seconds or that you didn't have that piece of pie. I mean, it isn't how it works. It's like we never regret declining third round of tequila shots <laughs> no one ever wakes up thinking i should have had more tequila that night we never do we're always like let's just move forward so with all of these things in the holidays just if we could try to get just a little bit more awareness to how much of it is just the hype yeah absolutely and also the the thing about well it's christmas i'm going to treat myself or, you know, it's the weekend, I've been good all week, so I deserve a treat at the weekend. Um, I think, okay, maybe if it's just one thing on one, uh, around one meal, like on you know, a Saturday night, someone's going out, they're going out for a date night with their partner and they're having a meal and it's a nice meal, great, okay. But as long as it doesn't lead to copious amounts of extra food after that and then the next day and then all the rest of it, and then it goes, oh, Monday morning I'm gonna start again then potentially, if you're okay with management of that, then that's great. If you know that having, I don't know, French fries with your dinner is going to make you, is going to set you off on a runaway train to haagen land, then just don't do it. Don't use yeah. it as a, don't use it as a reward, because it's not, because the next morning you're going to feel bloated and horrible. And when, when you wake up, actually feeling lean and not bloated. It's a much nicer experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is about the whole cheat day concept, which I personally don't advocate because I think it's really hard, like you said, to that runaway train to haagen land to make the cheat day, sorry, the cheat meal and do a cheat day and do a cheat weekend and do a cheat week and do a cheat life. Because for so many of us, when we're still thinking of food as good and bad and I'm good or bad or food is a reward, we're still in that like diet mentality, right? So we're still rewarding ourselves with food. We're still having an emotional response to food. We've been really good. And, you know, when we really, really enjoy truffle fries or whatever it is, and we are incapable of having a couple without just things going off the rails. We really should just avoid them. Mm, I agree. Be because it's just a problematic food for us. 
and that's just how life is. Like, it's not a judgment of you as a person or whether or not, you know, you're nice or whatever. It's just, I just really can't eat sugar because it makes me crazy and it, life is better without it. And mm. there, you know, that and my eyes are green. Those are just all facts. So it isn't a big deal to me because I don't make it a big deal. And, you know, a lot of people are always like dumbfounded that I don't drink anymore. I never really drank, but I just definitely don't anymore because I don't know how I feel the next day. It's just not worth it to me. And I just don't like anything about it. If you want to drink, that's cool. I'll go with you to a bar. I'll sit with you at a bar. I'll even have, uh, you know, Pellegrino with ice and a lemon in a stemware glass. I don't mind being with you in a bar. I just don't need to drink it. Mm. So there's so many ways to still be part of society and still have a really good time without getting drunk or without eating the cake or without thinking that everyone's looking at you because nobody really is. Yeah, you're right. And I think also this is where... Uh, if it fits your macros, breaks down. Because mm. people will go, yeah, but you know, you can eat Pop-Tarts because that was the main thing that people, for some reason, associate with it. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, you can, you, can do, you, you can eat all these foods so long as it hits your protein, fats, and carbohydrate requirements. And in yeah. theory, in theory, that could work. But in reality, if you start eating foods for the, the the fact that it's you know ice cream and I can make my other foods fit into it it's very unlikely that the the 32 grams of ice cream that you can fit in is is going to be enough because you're not going to have a teaspoon and a quarter of ice cream you're going to you're going to go in and you're going to end up having three quarters of a tub and then go oh now I've actually can't eat any carbs or any fat for the next two days if I need this to fit into my weekly schedule. So it just doesn't work from that perspective. If you know, if you can eat something, if you can eat a bit of cheesecake and you fit it into your thing and you never deviate outside of that, then great. But I think the practicality, the real life scenario of that is, it doesn't work. Yeah, I think for most people, they shouldn't even like entertain that yeah. because it's just easier and cleaner and just a better way to just you know for an extended period of time you know and you I honestly with unless my client can stick to a food plan for three months I don't even want to hear about a cheat day mm. I mean when someone in day four is like well I, I I snuck something I'm like you haven't even stuck to anything to sneak something um you know it, it's just I don't personally think that like, you know, if it can fit in your macros and Weight Watchers used to have the same kind of workarounds where if it fit in your points, you could eat whatever you wanted. Well, I was eating nothing but um, fat free macaroons and, and Cool Whip. Because mm. it fits uh, and that's great. But you know, I feel yeah. crap on the back of it. There's no vitamins and minerals in that. And, yeah, I was, I was starving, by the way. And, and I get, um, you know, I get if it fits your macros. You can use that if the foods you're eating are clean foods or good foods, right? Totally. Because you can, you can mean, have I a... Have, yeah, I could have made good choices. I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's because people try and cheat the system and say, okay, well, I'm allowed to do this, that, and the other as long as it fits this wall, and therefore they go down the wrong road and then end up eating a very nutrient-poor diet because well, that it allowed them to have that, that sugar junk thing that they wanted and feel okay about it. And and sadly, it just doesn't work for the majority of people. Well, the thing is too about diets, and this is what I'm asked a lot, is why can't we stick to diets? And one of the main reasons is because we go on them. And the reason we go on them is so we can go off of them. So the, you know, the main theory behind diets is I'm going to do this whatever plan, right? For three months, for or three weeks, for nine months or whatever, I'm going to do this thing that I don't really want to do. I'm going to eat a certain way so one day I can eat how I want, right? That's sort of what we all agree to. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. 
because why if I starve myself to 125 pounds and then I can eat how I want when I get there, would I ever be able to stay there? It doesn't make any sense, but we all agree to it. And why don't I ever spend any time thinking about how I gained the 50 pounds in the first place? Let's not do that. Let's just count points or macros or carbs or whatever we're counting this week. So when we have that dieting mentality, the first thing most dieters like to do is find the loopholes. Yeah, absolutely. I know this because I used to, A, be a chronic dieter, and B, I worked for a big diet company. So <laughs> when I used to work at Weight Watchers, we would sit there because I was a client. I worked for them. I used to go to their trainings. And we'd have, we'd have these meetings sometimes where there'd be people that would bring in, you know, hey, I was at the grocery store the other day, and for four points, I can eat, you know, 12 pieces of some sort of bread-like thing, and, you know, and everybody would go out and buy it, and it tasted like cardboard, but it was like, you know, you, they could eat tons and tons of this processed stuff, which it's just missing the point of healthy eating. It's like, where are the workarounds? Where are the workarounds? Mm. Where are the workarounds? And I get this question a lot about stevia or agave or maple syrup or any of those sort of things where it's like, but why can't I have stevia? Like it's still, it's still an artificial sweetener. You're still tricking your brain to think something sweet. Your body's still in that sugar place. So let's just eliminate all the sugar so you're not constantly looking for sugar and move on with your life. What about swaps? Same thing. What about keto desserts? Same thing. It's like they keep wanting me to give them another answer, and the answer is going to be no, 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 no. Swaps are really fun. I get it. You want to have you know your cake and eat it too, ha, ha, ha. But if you want a new way of life, if you really, really want to not be obsessed with cake, eating a keto cake is not the answer. The answer is no more cake. Yeah. And and the whole cheat thing about, you know, you, you, you get somebody that says, okay, when can I have a cheat meal? First thing they ask you, when can I have a cheat meal? You know, you've been cheating it's the different. last, you've been cheating the last 30 years. You don't need one. <laughs> Seriously. Your entire life's been a cheat meal. I yeah. know. And if they come in and ask about a cheat meal right away, it's like, are you even ready for this? Yeah. Like, that's what I always wonder is like, are they just doing this so they can be thin for the reunion or the wedding or the whatever and then what you mentioned earlier was like people that go on big diets for vacations now those are interesting diets as well because they'll you know starve themselves for two weeks or a month so they can you know, look good on you know as you guys like to call it a holiday or mm -hmm. as we call it in america a vacation but and then they'll go and just you know do nothing but drink pina coladas and eat themselves into a complete stupor, come back, you know, all the weight has found them again and they brought friends and they feel awful. Awful. Well, because they crash dieted and then they completely went in the other direction and they probably sat in the sun and did nothing but like just treat their body like dirt. And they're surprised. Mm. So, I, I think, personally, I think you're better not to diet for a holiday. In, in fact, I think you're going to enjoy your holiday much more if you haven't tried to get all this weight off previously. And I also think you're going to not put as much weight on. And I don't mean, oh, well, of course not. If you've lost £10 before you went, then you won't put the £10 back. I mean, your body is just more conditioned to eat in that crap that you're going to eat anyway. And if that's your lifestyle, then why start changing things just to sit on a beach? It's just crazy. It's no, there's no point to it. And why don't we address the underlying issues that you're having about why you're slightly heavier than you than you should be from a health perspective? And that way you can then go on holiday and enjoy it. I went, um, you know, I've been on all inclusives before where I've been intermittent fasting and ketogenic and managed it perfectly well. I've also been yeah. on them before where I've eaten everything in sight. And, and I know the one I, I preferred, but I preferred going there, honestly, and going to breakfast and with my with my other half and not 
letting her eat what she wants and I'll just have to have a coffee or whatever it is and you know breakfast uh, lunchtime I have food and it's really easy to eat if you are going to be ketogenic I'm not now but during that time I was if you're going to eat your ketogenic it's really easy to do especially when it's a, a an all-inclusive that's just got huge amounts of all different foods available you can easily pick the right stuff but you feel a lot better than if you're just sat on your backside all day doing nothing and then eating tons of ice cream and waffles mm-hmm. so it yeah. is available and it is a choice you know as you said yeah. it is a choice and i've been all inclusives i've been to a couple that are like european run and then i've been to a couple that are american run and the difference is very noticeable um the european run ones have way better food first of all <laughs> Yes, we do. <laughs> the food is much better. Um, but the, I agree. I think if you try to stick to a normal way of eating, and if you do have, you know, whatever you whatever, whatever is important to you, then you'll feel a lot better than if you starved yourself leading up to it, and then you just went all in for, you know, a week, 10 days, two weeks, or whatever, and then come back and just feel horrible. But... A lot of people don't really like the slow and steady approach. They want the extremes. They want the workarounds. They want to know what the secret is. I agree. The secret is like to do the reasonable thing. Yeah. There isn't a secret. The um, do you know what really impressed me once on, a, on an all inclusive? Funny enough, we talk about it. Is there were um, the, the way we went? There were a lot of Scandinavians there, and. There was a, I remember watching a girl who was probably four years old. Uh, she could just about hold a plate and walk to the to the counter for the foods. Yeah. And bear in mind, there was everything available. Pizza, burgers, chips, salads, chicken, whatever, right? And she went and got a, a whole grilled fish, head, tail, the lot. The, the, the guy put it on her plate for her and she walked back. I remember her trying to balance it on the plate to get back to her table, put it on the table, got up on the seat and just with her fingers started eating the fish. Like it's just completely normal to them. And her parents were kind of doing the same thing and it was just so incredible to watch that this young girl who's fat, who's got all this stuff in front of her, pizza, burgers, all the rest of it, decides we're going to go and have a grilled fish. With the head and tail on, you know, most people would look at it and just go, oh, my God, that's disgusting. How can people eat that kind of thing? Oh, it's terrible. And and it was just so good to watch because clearly that was her culture. It was how she was brought up and it's perfectly normal to her. So it shows that we can do that stuff. It's just a choice. Yeah, it's how she, it's also her environment. I mean, like you said, her parents were doing it. So, you know, my kids definitely eat a lot better than their friends. Um, you know, one of my favorite parenting moments when I called my daughter at summer camp and she said, mom, the salad bar is so much better this year than last year. And I was like, oh, oh. great. She eats salad without me making her. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a lot of times when you see kids on their own, everything is tan, pizza, chicken, French fries. Absolutely. It is possible. It is also possible for people to change how they eat without, you know, upsetting their mom or, you know, making everybody at work feel this or any of the other stories they tell themselves because all those are really our stories, you know, and I'll hear all these things like, you know, someone threw me a birthday party, so I had to eat the cake. I'm like, did you? They're excuses. They're excuses to not be responsible. But they're excuses and they believe them. Hmm. That's the thing is like, it's one thing if you give an excuse like the dog ate your homework, but you don't believe it yourself. <laughs> but then people believe it. Like when they tell me I had to eat the cake because someone threw me a birthday party. And I'm like, oh, so they sat there and watched you eat the cake? Like, well, no. I'm like, mm. like well, I could not have some. I'm like, but also, really? it, it like, absolves them from being responsible. Totally. It wasn't That's my fault. Thing, it's like, it wasn't my fault. I was given it. It was a birthday party. They made me have it. So it's nothing to do with me. Totally. It, like it, it has that like effect of distancing themselves mm. from the responsibility of, you know, why I weigh what I currently weigh. It's because it was just my birthday and I gained five pounds. Like, yeah. you know, 
I even had this particular talk with this client, like, so where do you want to be after your birthday? Like, what, what's our goal? She's like, I want to be my exact same way that I am now. I'm like, okay, that's cool. How are we going to get there? All right, we're going to do A, B, and C. All right, great, cool. Text her every day. Where are we at? Every single day of her birthday weekend, I was mostly good, but I was mostly good, but I was mm-hmm. mostly good, but I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Mostly good, but is why you have weight to lose, you know? And the thing is like all these habits always start with our mindset and our thoughts. So mostly good, but is why you're not where you want to be because you let yourself be okay with mostly good, but while if you are at a place where you want a higher level of performance or how you feel or how you look or how you, whatever, you know, that, mostly good isn't really going to cut it and that you have choices and it's all just food. Like that's what I always tell the people. It's just food. You don't really need to eat everything that people are serving you and you don't need to, you know, it was just my daughter's birthday. I mean, after her birthday went on forever, but you know, I didn't need to eat everything that was around her birthday in order for my daughter to feel like I cared about her birthday. Like if you asked her, did your mom eat your birthday cake? I guarantee you she would not notice. Yeah. She could not tell you. Not just because she's 13 and self-absorbed, but <laughs> because it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Like, and, I, and I also I think mean, people people lose the connection between losing weight and improving their health. They don't yeah. correlate it. They just go, oh, I've got to lose weight, I've got to lose weight. And then they eat something that isn't great and all the rest of it. You know, I was mostly good, but but the, what, what isn't ever mentioned within any of this is how it affects your, your health long-term your longevity, your um, cognitive function, you know, everything around it, cardiovascular risk, cancer, heart, you know, all that kind of stuff. People don't even get down to that sort of level of conversation. They're just worried about where I fit in my genes next week. And and they don't see it as it makes any sort of difference. But I'm sure we could talk about it for many hours more, but we're not going to. Um, it's already been, just looking now, an hour and 22 that we've been we've been recording so um what i do want to talk about finally is where people can actually find more about you and the book that you've written and if they want to contact you on social and stuff like that where's the best place to find you yeah sure no problem i am at aaron Wathen wellness that's my handle on facebook and instagram and my website and my book uh why can't i stick to my diet is available for pre-order right now and it'll be on amazon on december 18th and i was very lucky because i got a copy previous and i got to read it worth a purchase for sure even if even if it is just to get yourself to understand that there is a pattern you need to be aware of you've got to recognize what's going on and not be a victim to your your cultural upbringing or, or, you know, think that eating this ice cream is going to make my boss less of an idiot tomorrow. Because <laughs> once you've, once you've got that, you know what? Sometimes it's just something so simple that makes such a big switch. And Maybe your boss is just an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> give him the ice cream. You'd be better off. You know, if you want to, if you want to really get back at him, give him the ice cream. Don't eat it yourself. Yeah, um, give, give the idiot the ice cream. Yeah. Um, it's been great. I, I did, cool. As far as like when we put our health in front of our weight, the weight is bound to follow. Yeah. But when we put the scale above the health and the everything else, it never works out. No. So just think about, you know, if, if I could say this, our health is what really matters. You know, the gene size, the scale, all those superficial things, those are just, you know, little details but our health is what the top priority is absolutely. There's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of very skinny people who are very unhealthy oh absolutely so <laughs> it doesn't correlate um Aaron, it's been great catching up and chatting um i'm sure that the conversation will go on for a long time um but um until we speak again because i think we will because there's so much more that we could we could go through um, i can see that thank you for coming on today and spending the time um I'm going to put all the links to the, to the book and for your social and everything in the show notes. Um, and so, again, many thanks for coming on, and um, we'll speak soon.
Thank you so much.